welcome to Behind the Line, where we pull back the curtain on the challenges facing first responders and frontline workers. The work you do is unique, and so are the stresses that go with it. Join me as we tackle key issues to reduce risks for burnout, and as we work to support you in doing the job you love without sacrificing being the kind of person you want to be. Hey there, and welcome back to Behind the Line. I'm your host, Lindsay Foss. If you're new to Behind the Line, what you should know about me is that I'm a clinical counselor specializing in trauma therapy, and after over a decade working with first responders and frontline workers around issues like burnout, compassion fatigue, PTSD, and related OSIs, I've become a passionate wellness advocate and educator for those who sacrifice so much for our communities out on the front lines. Behind the Line is a place for us to talk about the real life behind the scenes challenges facing you on the front lines. I created this podcast with the hope of bringing easy access to skills for wellness, allowing you to find greater sustainability both on the job and off. Today, we are finishing up our on leave series. And I know that there is so much more around the topic of being off work that we could cover. For today, we're going to focus on managing guilt and other tough feelings that tend to come up when we're away from the work that we have loved and been committed to doing. Whether we're off work due to injury, illness, mental health concern, or some other reason, being off often comes with a host of emotions, big and small, obvious and more innocuous, that can disrupt our ability to focus on recovering and can force us to struggle more when we're trying so hard to pick ourselves up. Before we dive in, I do want to honor that for those listening who are off work, there may be pieces you hoped we would cover that we haven't yet in this series. And if that's the case, I would really love to hear from you so we can follow this series up with any topics that would serve you and the needs you have well. Give me a shout out on Facebook or Instagram at Lindsay A. Foss or shoot me an email at support at thrive-life.ca, and let me know what you would like to hear us tackle. All right, when I first sat down to outline the On Leave series, I intended for this episode to be a conversation about self-care and how this needs to adapt when we're off work. But as I started getting into the details of the series and this episode, I realized that while self-care is a piece, what we actually need to talk about is bigger deeper. We need to talk about the yucky stuff that lives underneath that tends to make the time off really tricky and can prevent us from being able to utilize self-care strategies and adapt them to our needs. What is the dark underbelly I'm referring to? Well, guilt, shame, neglect, abandonment, loneliness, identity, These are the heavy hitters on the list. Let's take these one at a time and talk about how they tend to show up most commonly in being off work. And then we'll work at talking about how we try to move through them and make our way to something more recovery oriented. Let's start with guilt. Guilt is a feeling whose job it is to let us know that we have done something wrong. Appropriate guilt shows up when we've violated someone else's boundary and behaved in a way that is contradictory to our own values. It's the emotion that causes us sufficient discomfort to move us toward apologizing, making amends, and being accountable. It's what helps us drive change within ourselves in order to live more in alignment with who we see ourselves as being and how we wish for others to experience us. Guilt, when appropriate, is actually a really helpful emotion that allows us to have morality and ethic. It guides us in engaging in ways that are principled and grants us the capacity to have a relatively functioning society. Now, you may have noticed that I used the word appropriate a couple of times in there to describe guilt that is meaningful and helpful. 
The challenge with guilt is that we can have a tendency to inappropriately generalize it to situations where it doesn't belong. We can feel badly for what we perceive to be a problem, even if it's not, or if it's not our problem to feel badly about. Here's an example. I often hear people who are in first response and frontline work roles share that they feel guilty for going off work when they are fully aware of the staffing crisis their specific workplace and profession are facing. The guilt weighs heavy on them, and they wrestle to use the time off to focus on their own wellness and recovery because they're racked with the emotional burden of guilt surrounding removing themselves from the staffing rotation. The problem with this is that going off work isn't violating anyone's boundary. Feeling guilt for going off work doesn't serve anyone in terms of having accountability and amends and repair and moving forward with changed behaviors. The guilt for going off is not yours. It belongs with the system that fails to staff appropriately or under recruits. It belongs with the upper level directors and managers who have failed to offer more support and manage staff retention. It belongs to the professions that have limited access to entering the field. It belongs to the government level funding limitations. Guilt for the staffing shortages belongs in a lot of places, but it doesn't belong with you. Look, I get it. It's hard to be off work and hear from coworkers about how they're drowning. It's hard to not be emotionally connected to that. We're empathic and we feel a sense of awareness of what it feels like to be in their shoes. Yet we, as one singular person, are not going to be the difference between drowning and thriving. And we can't help others if we're not okay. The trickiest thing about guilt is that we have culturally tied it in many ways to another feeling. Shame. If you haven't read Brene Brown's work yet, do it. This is her wheelhouse. She and others who research shame have identified over and over again that shame is the one feeling that offers nothing. Guilt communicates something to us. It says that a thing I said or did was hurtful and not okay, and I need to work to repair that. Shame says that because I said or did that thing that was hurtful, that there must be something wrong with me, that I am bad. Guilt gives us the discomfort to move us toward repair. Shame just undermines our sense of self, and it can rob us of feeling like we have worth. Guilt has the power to move us toward an outcome that's connective and healing, Shame serves zero positive function. It only erodes. I often find myself drawing the difference between guilt and shame for clients, and it frequently feels revelatory to consider that guilt, an uncomfortable emotion, serves a meaningful function, and that shame, an all too familiar and even more uncomfortable emotion, only serves to harm us and others. When I allow shame to have a voice in my head, it not only undermines my internal sense of worth, value, and meaning, but from that place, it impacts how I am likely to show up in my world, which vicariously robs others of what I might otherwise bring to the table. Shame makes us play small and fearfully. It makes us worried about how others will see us and terrified that they might see what I fear is true of me. It makes us pull back and hide in the shadows for fear of being fully seen and exposed. This feels simultaneously protective of my shame and totally isolating and lonely. When I talk with people who are off work, especially from helping professions, there is a lot of pride that comes with the work they do. It feels like it means something about them that they do the job they do. And that's cool, mostly. But then it also feels like it means something about them when they can't do 
what they did for a period of time, or perhaps ever again. This has a tendency to elicit self-judgments and a shit ton of shame. It means I can't hack it. I'm not strong enough. I failed. And so on. When we think about sitting in these feelings and self-thoughts, it doesn't seem like the greatest place from which to experience healing and recovery, does it? On top of guilt and shame connected to being off work and how we make meaning of ourselves for being off work, we can also face another set of emotional challenges, neglect, abandonment, and loneliness. All too often, I hear people who are off work share about how they wrestle with the discrepancy between what their work team meant to them when they were working versus how that same team ghosted once they went off. Unfortunately, this is a really common experience. First response in frontline workplaces tend to language concepts like brotherhood and family into their workplace identities. They focus heavily on having each other's backs. They are often professions where we spend a disproportionate amount of time together compared to other kinds of jobs, and we spend it entrenched in stress where it's an us-against-the-world approach to interacting with whatever comes our way today. While all of this can contribute to really bonded workplace teams, it can also feel really difficult for those who exit this dynamic to take a leave from work. We can feel out of the loop, not included, and even forgotten. Some workplaces are good at following up and checking in but others allow their on-leave staff to essentially fall off the face of the earth. A client once told me that while they hated that no one reached out to check on them while being off work, they could also understand it because it would be difficult to be in the work and feel a mirror held up that may challenge their own capacity to remain at work. It's a nose to the grindstone, just keep putting one foot in front of the other approach. Don't look up, don't look around, don't see what's happening on a bigger scale, because it might cause us to trip up and fall apart too. For those off work, it can feel like the family that they invested so heavily into for so long has neglected or abandoned them. This is more than just words, it's actually a deep felt sense of attachment loss. We get a sense of who we are and how we matter by receiving feedback from the world around us. When the people we trusted and relied on to give us feedback that we are good and meaningful and whatever else stop connecting and reaching out, we have difficulty making sense of that in any way other than I must not be worth it or good enough and so on. That doesn't make it true or an accurate answer, just the story that we're most likely to tell ourselves to make sense of how the family seems to have forgotten about me. If we've failed to cultivate relationships outside of our work, this can be especially negatively impactful because not only are we facing what is experienced as rejection and abandonment, but we're also experiencing isolation and loneliness Because without these relationships and the routine of being at work day to day, I lack access to other people who can be part of my community of support, which, heads up, is pretty invaluable while working at recovering. This is one of the reasons I harp on you guys so much in these episodes about building a diverse community of support for yourselves, so that if one piece of your community is compromised, or the dynamic changes significantly, as it can with work relationships when off work, you have other pieces to fall back on to support you. The final heavy emotion-laden piece I want us to talk about today is around identity. Now, identity isn't so much an emotion in and of itself as it is a set of perceptions. But we have a lot of feelings about our identity, and a lot of feelings that come up when it feels like my sense of identity is compromised. 
We've talked a number of times on the show in the past about how identity and first response and frontline work tends to get very tightly woven together. It's in part a cultural feature that Western culture tends to overvalue profession as a signifier of who a person is, as well as the family or brotherhood pieces that invite us to feel tightly bound to the work we do, as well as finding a deep sense of personal meaning in the profession we find ourselves serving in. When we layer these pieces together, we find that who we are as people, how we know ourselves, feels inextricably intertwined with the jobs that we do. While facets of this can feel good at times, it can be extremely challenging when we find ourselves in a period of being off work. Because I'm not only faced with the difficulty of being away from something I like doing or feel good at, but I actually feel cut off from a sense of myself. I don't know who I am or how to be me if I'm not at work doing the job I've done for so long. I don't feel stable or can't find my footing without this thing that defines me so heavily. Again, this is why we've talked quite a bit about identity on the show before, and I have really pushed that we need to challenge this approach to entering this kind of profession because it makes it so much harder when we discover the truth that no one is built for this work. No one is wired to do it indefinitely, and no one comes out unscathed. If we don't learn to detangle our sense of self from the work that we do, we are going to be faced with more significant losses when we take time off work or eventually retire because we will lose ourselves. We need to have a reference point for who we are and why we matter that has nothing to do with the job that pays my bills. Without that, facing a time of being off work will feel like an internal battle beyond recovery from injury, illness, or mental health concern. It will up the ante a thousandfold at a time where you already feel vulnerable and under-resourced. I recently was holding interviews for interns that our clinic is recruiting to work with us for the coming year. During one of the interviews, the student said something profound, and I want to share it with you. She said, you know how in other professions they have tools they use to do a job? Like a plumber has wrenches and a carpenter has hammers and saws and a surgeon has scalpels. Each of these professionals are required to maintain their tools in order for them to function well, to be useful when they're needed. They have to invest time and energy and expense, not just in using the tools, but in keeping them tuned up, serviced, and maintained. Then she said, what I am realizing as a therapist is that I am the tool. It's me. I am the tool that does the work. And I need to invest time, energy, and expense into regular tune-ups and maintenance to ensure that I can use me to do the work when I need to. I obviously loved this so much, and it really does connect to all of you too. As helping professionals, we are fundamentally the tool. It would be hard to replace you with a robot. You being a person, your personhood, is a significant part of what makes you an asset in the work that you do. Meanwhile, our personhood is also what makes us vulnerable in the work that we do and what makes us vulnerable to the various feelings we've mentioned here today. If we recognize that we are the tool and we account for maintaining this tool so it serves us well in the places it's needed, then we find ourselves circling back once again to the inherent and inescapable value of self-care. Engaging in self-care is one of the most significant ways we can buffer ourselves from the impacts of the work. It is also among the most significant interventions we can use when whatever buffer we may have has dissolved and we feel completely depleted, burnt out, and on the verge of collapse. 
Now, let me remind you that when I talk about self-care, I am not talking about bubble baths and spa days, nor am I talking about you sitting alone in a room doing something nice for yourself, but still feeling lonely, isolated, and detached from connection. Self-care has gotten a bit of a bad rap in our heavily commercialized world, and I am going to ask you to suspend whatever notions you have about self-care for a moment and hear me out. Self-care is the act of showing ourselves value in an effort to train our brains to experience valuing. We can do this by taking a bath if we love baths and find them to be very relaxing and refreshing, but it can also be things like choosing not to spend time with people who feel toxic or bring out the worst in me, or stepping into discomfort to cultivate new relationships that may or may not pan out to be great friendships someday. Self-care is not just tasks done from myself for myself. It's an invitation for me to think of myself, to consider myself, my needs, and value these. It's a willingness to being open to considering my feelings, what they're saying about my needs, and engaging in this. An example of a self-caring action you may not traditionally consider self-caring is noticing guilt felt about something I said or did and allowing myself to step into the discomfort of apologizing and making repair because it allows me to gift myself with being back in alignment with the person I want and choose to be. It also allows me to gift myself with relief from feeling a continued state of guilt while I ignore what it's trying to tell me. Another example of a self-caring action may be to reach out to personal connections I haven't connected with in a while. I might feel some guilt for not having better maintained these relationships, but the self-care is to know my need for connection and seek it out despite the discomfort of confronting that guilt and gifting myself with the opportunity to have my need for connection met if we can work to invest in rebuilding a closer relationship. Self-care is a piece we've talked about on the show many times, and I would encourage you to take a look back to some of those episodes if you want more of what this should, could, would look like. I will say that a common dynamic for those off work is an added sense of guilt that comes with focusing on themselves and engaging in self-care. It can feel hard to adapt to a skill set when it feels unfamiliar. If I haven't made the time and space to engage self-care much or strategically before, it will be uncomfortable to try it on and practice it. We can be especially critical of what we deserve while we're off work, like not working somehow defines what we're entitled to enjoying or experiencing. We can place limits on caring for ourselves while off work, deciding that it feels too uncomfortable or incongruous with being hurt or sick. Meanwhile, if you think about caring for someone else while they are hurt or sick, would you tell them that they aren't worth it? They don't deserve it? My hunch is no. My guess is that you are probably the first person to set up a meal train for them or recruit friends to pitch in for a cleaning service or something like that. At the heart of it, self-care is about treating us with the same care that we would tend to extend to others and believing that our worth and deserving is fundamental and no different than anyone else's. It's about investing in us the way we do others and building us up because when we are our most cared for selves, we tend to offer and extend the best to other people in our lives, which is what we all deserve. If you want to dig in deeper around self-care, check out season one, episodes 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14. You can also poke through our series on back to basics that we did this season, where we cover some fundamental aspects of self-care. Look for season two, episodes nine through 17. That should keep you busy. As we wrap up today, I want to encourage you to please reach out and connect if you have any questions or feedback. I love hearing from you and shaping this podcast to echo your needs and interests. I also love, more than you know, hearing about what you're working on and how you're using what we talk about on the show. 
You can follow me on Facebook and Instagram at Lindsay A. Foss, or you can email me at support at thrive-life.ca. I continue to be so amazed and inspired by this community that we're building together. I'm so grateful for your support and that many of you are keen to share about behind the line to others on the front lines. Thank you so much for sharing with those you know. Know that we can be found online on our website, on most major podcast platforms, as well as on YouTube. Click subscribe to get alerts about our latest episodes, or subscribe to our email list to hear from me about all the exciting things that we have going on and coming up. You'll find all the details you need in the show notes, along with links to our free Beating the Breaking Point Indicators Checklist and Triage Guide, which helps you to facilitate self-assessing burnout and related concerns. If you haven't checked it out and downloaded it yet, do it. It's worth it. And it's free. We make all of these tools available to you because the work you do matters. But more than that, you matter. And we want to make sure that you have what you need to keep up the good work at work, as well as in your real and meaningful life outside of the work you do. So use it and share it. And until next time, stay safe.